of fun either way. At least some of us will. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you for your word, and we ask that you would bring understanding, increase revelation to us, we pray. Cause us to see and understand, so that way we can mix faith. The whole purpose of revelation isn't that we can be promoted. The whole purpose of revelation and understanding of your word is that we would be able to accurately assess what it is that you're saying and what is your will concerning a certain thing. And then we can mix our agreement and our faith with it. That includes us verbalizing and vocalizing our agreement by confessing. Confess. We say what you say. I thank you that you'll increase revelation to us this evening so we can mix faith with it. And we give you glory and honor and praise. Let the, the light come on. Cause us to see and understand. I thank you that even though there may be some things that need to be adjusted or corrected, that it's your goodness that leads us to repent and change our way of thinking about things. And we give you the glory for that. We give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Don, turn me down just a little bit, if you would, because I'm going to go to screaming tonight. That's probably not true. If you have your Bibles, let's turn over to uh, 1 Kings, I think we'll go to to start. And we're going to continue on uh, this topic of dominion. And we were talking about the reality of us having dominion because God has given humanity dominion. And then Adam and Eve, of course, as we know in the Word of God, gave that up. But Jesus came to restore us, humanity, to a position of authority over the work of God's hand. God has not changed his plan. His original purpose and intent was that humans would rule the earth that he created. And so we went to Genesis chapter 1, and we talked about that and discussed that. And, of course, we have authority over things uh, that, that we know very familiar, uh, you know, birds of the air and fish of the sea and bumblebees and insects and creepy things that creep and cattle. But in that text, God says, and over all that is in the earth, over all that is in the earth. And we know that the resources that we have need of in this life are in the earth. We understand through the Word of God and just our heart is simply that we are not interested in chasing money. We want to use money. Amen. Because it has a purpose and it does help. It is a tool. That's why we call it a resource. It is a tool. It's not to be worshipped. It's a horrible master. Uh, but it is a good tool when it's in the hand of good people. Amen. And so we talked about, uh, just to kind of recap, we talked about Dr. Oral Roberts. I was so blessed to see different people posting about, uh, you know, their reading that book after uh, the Lord had talked to me about it and, and had me talk to you about it. And it's weird to think that folks actually go out and listen to what you say and then do it. Well, that's a pretty powerful concept. But uh, Dr. Oral Roberts wrote a book 39 years ago called The Miracle of Seed Faith is what it's known for now, but it actually is... Uh, a pact with God and man. And in that, there are three basic principles. And the first one is that we must understand that God is our source, not our job, not our economy, not our president, not our government, not our inheritance, not our wealth, not our retirement fund. God is our source. Amen. And then secondly, we understand, according to that teaching and the, the uh, revelation that the Lord gave Dr. Oral Roberts, that we give to God first. And so I wanted to revisit 1 Kings chapter 17 just for a moment and kind of finish up on that and then talk a little bit about Jesus. And uh, every time I get up in a pulpit anywhere, I carry a big old stick and whack the devil every chance I get. And we're going to do that tonight. Some of you might be offended. Praise the Lord, we're going to do it anyway. And Elisha the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word. There's a position of authority. I want to read it again. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, 
There shall not be dew nor rain these years except at my word, not God's word, my word. We see in the, in the account that God instructed him to go to the brook Cherith, and there he said, I'll cause ravens to come and feed you. Man, I don't know about you, but how important is it to be in the right time, in the right place with God, and how easy is it for us to do that? All we have to do is be led by the Holy Spirit, amen? I mean, God set us up to win. We, we absolutely can't help but win. Y'all be shouting amen. We can't help but win. Praise God. And so we understand that at the brook Cherith that God is going to provide for him by the mouth of a dirty bird. He's going to bring him food every day. And then the brook dries up. The natural will always end before the supernatural. If you're writing that down, you ought to. The natural will always end before the supernatural. Always, 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 always. We'll prove it tonight. So the brook dries up, and God says it's time to move. And so he goes into Zarephath because he told him that there is, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, verse 9, and dwell there. So, see, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. So he rose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a, win a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, As the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, go back and make some for yourself and for your son. I believe, this is my opinion, and I think that any time a preacher shares their opinion, we have the obligation to tell you that it's our opinion. I ha I'm of the opinion that that woman went in to do exactly what it was that she intended to do for her and her son, and she recognized there must be something different about this man because she referenced the fact that as your God lives, she knows this is a holy man, a godly man. But I believe that she went in and made meal from the little flour in the bin and the little oil in the jar and I believe you would not be able to convince me otherwise. However, I can't promise you. But I believe that that jar was empty and that bin was empty. And the instruction of the man of God was go in first and make me a cake. Bring that cake to me and then go back. And I believe this with all my heart because I know God. That as that woman honored the word of the Lord, the Bible tells us that if we'll believe God will be established. If we believe his prophets, we will prosper. That's what the word says. If we believe God will be established. If we believe his prophets, we will prosper. And I believe that she left an empty bin of flour, and she left an empty jar of oil, and she went and said, <laughs> I hope this works. Either way, I'm dying today, and so is my kid, because we planned on dying today. Don't forget the story. Don't forget what she said. That was going to happen. And when she turned around to go back, probably thought in her head, this is useless. I just got done seeing that the bin of flour is empty. I just got done pouring out all the oil. It's all gone. So death either way, it's just going to come a little bit sooner now. And, oh my goodness, there's flour in the bin. Oh my Lord, there's oil in the jar. The Bible says that she did that many days. <laughs> Obey the instruction of the Lord. See, Isaiah says, and you're going to love me for this. Isaiah says that if you are willing and obedient, you know what I found out to be true? That so many of God's people are not qualifying for that verse. We want to eat the good of the land. We desire to have a, a, a nest egg that we could fall back on and, and to retire on. And we want to take care of ourselves and our children, and we want to take care of the ministry. But at some point, we have to flip a switch and not only be willing, but become obedient. Amen. 
the ingredients for expedience is obedience. If you want God to do something, go back to the last thing he told you to do and make sure you covered the base. The ingredients for God to bring the miracle to you in an expedient fashion is your obedience. So the Bible says that she went and did exactly what it was. She was gathering sticks. She made a morsel. She brought it to him first. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, 14, The bin of flour shall not be used up, nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day of the Lord sends, until the day of the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah. And she and he and her household ate for many, I like that word, many days. The bin of flour, 16, was not used up. Nor did the jar of oil run dry, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. Elijah is in a position of obedience, so he can stand in a position of authority. Jesus was a man, he told the, the, uh, the, the military man, the centurion, he said to him, I am a man under authority. I say, just like you, you say to one, go and he goes, and to come and he comes. And I see and I recognize this authority, and I'm not going to come into your house. And in fact, the man said, I, I, I don't really want you to come into my house because I am not as honorable or as esteemed as highly as you, and if you were to come into my house, then it would be a lowly, lowly position, and you would be honoring me, and we're not going to play that game because I am recognizing how you're doing what you're doing by the authority of God, and I do it the same way. So you just speak a word, say a word only, and I know that my servant will be healed. Amen. So Jesus is a man under authority. It was recognized even by the heathen. And the reason that he was able to stand in a position of authority is because he was obedient to the Father. And so, so like Elijah, he's been sent by God to go to a brook called Cherith. Wait there, and I'm going to feed you. And so he showed up. Praise God he didn't go to a brook called Shiawassee River. That would have been a problem. Amen. Besides the feces that flow, it would have been other issues. Never mind, we're moving right along. That's a real thing if you pay attention to the news. It's kind of creepy and gross. But anyway, he went to the right place, and he was in obedience. So he could say to the Lord, hey, you told me to come to this brook. I don't know about you, but if it would have been me and I didn't see a dirty bird bringing me any food, I would have made sure I was on the right side of the creek. But he went, and so he could stand in a position of authority, and he could make, now hear this word accurately, he could make a demand or draw or call for the provision of God. Why? Because he was obedient. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat. Shall. It's not maybe. If you are, you will. That's a command. Amen. This is a Holy Ghost, Spirit-filled, Word of Faith church, and you're thinking tonight, I think. See, a lot of times Christians quote the Bible, and the Bible in and of itself is not powerless, but our confession of it is because God is not going to ignore your disobedience in one area and violate that Scripture and bless you over here. And we think that that's how God is going to work. He doesn't really care, and it doesn't matter if I don't do what he told me to do in the arena of whatever it is. This promise over here says that he will thus and such. Well, most of those are contingent, and we haven't done the obedience part and we're over here like a little brat stomping our feet and making a demand that you're supposed to, and I can't believe you haven't, and I guess you never were going to in the first place. But we didn't obey the Lord. I'm preaching so good. Someone hand me an offering for myself. Elijah is a man in authority. Why is he in authority? Because he's submitted to God. Oh, I mean, I tell you. <laughs> I wish we could preach on that tonight. Why is he in authority? He's not limiting God. Remember, we just finished that sermon series. He's not limiting God because he's obedient to the voice of the Lord. He's not limiting God because he's honoring God and obeying God and positioning himself to receive the provision of the Lord. And he had a choice to say, Rain, I'm done with this. This is, this is stupid rain. 
but he didn't. See, because if we go back, and I can't do that, never mind. If we go back and we look at the original plan of that whole drought, God said, the heart of the children have turned away from me. Now go and help me get my kids back. So Elijah's a man on assignment, and it hurt him. He had to get up and go to the brook. Then he had to go and hide out because he thought that that wicked whack job was going to try to kill him just like she tried to kill all the other prophets of God. Her name was Jezebel. Praise the Lord. To his own detriment, he honored God. People say, I can't tithe. You can't not tithe. What are you talking about? To your own detriment, honor God. Well, you just want my money. No, I'd like to see you beat the devil and start eating his lunch instead of him eating your lunch. And the only way for you to do that, because you can't operate in authority unless you're under authority, and you can't function in a, in a sphere of spiritual power or authority unless you're submitted to the one who's the source. You can't afford not to do you can't afford not to come to church. It doesn't matter the arena. It doesn't matter. You can't afford to not pray. What are you what are you trying to what are you trying to do? You're gonna get up every day and not pray? Good luck. That's dumb. Amen. We have to submit to the will and the word of God. We have to submit to the, the plan and the purpose and the leading and the direction and the voice of the Lord. And then when we do, we can say, Father, we are both willing and obedient. We can stand in a position of authority and say to this earth, cough up whatever it is that I have need of. And through the dominion and the authority that we have in Jesus Christ, we can watch God deliver us from whatever it is, whatever pit we're in, whatever problem we're facing. If we are willing and obedient, we shall eat the good of the land. And many times we do not qualify. And we don't like that. Because bless God, we're Americans. I don't even know what that means, but we say stuff like that a lot. Wah! I'm preaching better than your amen -y. See, what we think, and I was talking to Holly Joe about this today. Because we live in a Hollywood world, and we think God's Hollywood. So what we wanted to happen was an atomic bomb of flour to go off in Zarephath. <laughs> flour everywhere. God's miraculous. He's not sensational. He's supernatural. He's not sensational. He's not spectacular. He's miraculous. We want to see the Exxon Valdez type spill of oil in Zarephath. Just flood them, kill all the animals, praise God, the provision of God is here. Who cares? Me. That's not what happened. Are you here? God is miraculous. And contrary to what I see and contrary to what I think and contrary to what I feel, if I'll stay focused with what God has told me to do and honor him, then I can stand in a position of authority. My authority is broken if I'm out of submission to God, his will, his word, his plan. But if I get myself in right alignment with God, God doesn't need to get in line with me. I need to adjust and get in line with him. And if I do so, then I can call for things that I have need of, and this world will cough them up no different than I can speak to whatever it is. I, we had the tornado come by, I don't know, a couple months ago, and uh, we were in the process. We had a whole bunch of folk at life groups, doing life groups. And I walked out in my front yard and stood and pointed my finger at a funnel cloud that dropped out of the sky. And I said, you get your butt back up there, bounce over my house, don't touch me, my property, or anybody in my church in the name of Jesus. And Allah told me I was crazy. And I said, I might be, but it worked. And I've told the testimony about how I was in Dallas, Texas. And the same, I walked out in Hilton Doubletree Hotel, the conference center. I hated that hotel. I should have let it burn down to the ground. <laughs> And I stood in the middle of that parking lot and a nasty green, gray, blue cloud was twirling and swirling above my head. And I had a preacher friend of mine and I'm at an international convention of faith ministers meeting. Faith ministers. The international convention. 
not just from Michigan. And these guys are saying, let's close down the meeting. And I said, we are supposed to be men and women of God who have authority over the wind and the waves in Jesus' name. And they said, well, you know. And I said, no, I don't know. You're supposed to be the leader. So I said to my friend, I won't name his name, Sam Wells. That's not true. I said to my friend, I'm going outside. And he said, are you crazy? I said, probably. And he said, why are you doing this? And I said, because I'm going to do something. And if it takes me up and kills me, at least I can say, I tried. So I stood out in the middle of that in Dallas, Texas, stood out in the middle of that parking lot. And I mean, there are tornadoes hitting everywhere. And I pointed my finger at that funnel cloud and I said, you get back up there, bounce over this hotel, that highway, and Saltgrass Steakhouse, because I'm going there this afternoon. You think I'm kidding, I was eating a prime rib in the afternoon. And all the power came from Jesus. And all the praise and the honor and the glory goes to Jesus. But I was a man under authority. I didn't have broken hedges. I had honored God with all of his tithe. I didn't go and pay for a car payment with it. I didn't have any broken hedges. I had obeyed what he told me to do, and so then I was able to stand in a position of authority, and I could say with my mouth, you pluck up from your root, you be removed from this to yonder place, and it shall be done for you. You might sit there and say, well, you're just bragging on yourself. No, I'm not. I'm telling you a testimony, which the Bible tells me that I should. And the Bible tells me that I should live as an example before you. And if I'm living as an example before you, I should tell you so. And you should follow after my example as I'm walking in Christ. This is all the Bible, New Testament. I'm not bragging on myself. I already told you I didn't do anything but what Jesus said for me to do. But I was able to do it because I didn't have any broken hedges and I didn't have any loose ends. Amen. I thought we were talking about money. We're actually talking about authority. We're actually talking about authority. Turn over to 2 Kings if you're okay with that. Willing and obedient. I've never been a Christian in my entire life. That's not true. I probably have. I haven't met very many Christians in my whole entire life that weren't willing to have the Lord bless them. You could live better, drive better, wear better, eat better, sleep better, take care of your kids better, take care of your aging this or that better, have another dog if you wanted to, or another baby. I haven't, very, I haven't met very many people that were not willing, except for those who were under the control of a religious spirit that said that you can't have anything, which is foolish. But not everybody qualifies. And so the question for you tonight is the same question that I have to ask myself on a regular basis. Do I qualify to eat the good of the land? And how how do I qualify? Does that mean that I'm perfect? Nope. That means I'm forgiven. It means that if I sin, and if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sin. What is sin? Missing the mark. It's an archery term for shooting. It means that there's a standard and we missed it. So when we miss it, then we just say, my bad. I didn't mean to miss it. Help me next time not to. We're not talking about being perfect. So what is it for you? When you ask yourself, do I qualify to eat the good of the land? You may say right now, I haven't really been obedient in these things. Maybe I've been obedient in what God said concerning my money, but I haven't been obedient with what God said concerning my mouth. Maybe I've been obedient with what God said about my money, and maybe I've been obedient with what God said about my mouth, but my attitude's been crappy. And so I'm giving, but it's grudgingly. And I know God says that he loves a a willing and prompt-to-do-it giver, but I wanted to buy a Taco Bell. I could make a joke about diarrhea right now, but I won't because we're, we're in church. Did you find 2 Kings chapter 4 yet? 2 Kings chapter 4. 
This is another place I wanted you to see that the, the natural will always end before the supernatural. And here's another way the Christians want God to be spectacular. If you're going to have a baby, don't do it on the front row. Jesus. <laughs> Clean up your womb, but stay. Might as well teach her now. <laughs> Lord. Alexis, get your hand off of her stomach. So help me God, I'm not delivering a baby in this church tonight. What was I saying? Here's another opportunity that Christians want God to be spectacular. God sensational. But God's just miraculous, just plain old boring miraculous. A certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets, cried out to Elisha, saying, Your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that your servant feared or honored the Lord, and the creditor is coming to take my two sons to be his slaves. So Elisha said to her, What shall I do for you? What do you want me to do? Then he says, Tell me, what do you have? Give to God first. What do you have? You bring something to the table. What do you have in your house? And she said, your maidservant has nothing in the house. Oh, wait a minute. I've got a jar of oil. And then he said, verse 3, this is a powerful statement. Remember the man of God came and said, here's these arrows, strike the ground. Remember that story? And he said, why did you stop? Why did you quit? Our thinking. Remember I said on Sunday that poverty doesn't start in your account. It doesn't start in your wallet. It starts in your mouth, and it starts in your head. That's fact. There is a mindset behind it, and there is a spiritual condition and climate also behind it. But I have watched the power of poverty be broken by the power of the cross. I have watched the power of poverty be broken by the power of giving by the law of seed time and harvest, the law of reciprocity. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in the lives of others. And I'm not talking about having 17 Cadillacs pulled with a Lincoln. I'm not talking about having 100 houses because you just can't figure out where you want to live. I'm talking about having more than enough. Dad Hagen used to say that rich means a full supply. That means you don't have need of anything else. It doesn't mean you have everything. That means you don't have need of anything else. Amen. Verse 3, same with the man striking the ground with arrows. He says to her, go and borrow vessels from everywhere. Go and borrow them from all of your neighbors. Go and borrow as many vessels, empty. And then he says, gather not a few. Do not get just a few. Why? Because Elisha knows a secret about God. And he knows that the natural will always end before the supernatural. So he says, go and borrow these vessels. And when you have come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour it into all those vessels and set aside the full ones. Verse 5, so she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full, everybody say full, not just a little bit in the bottom of the vase. Not a little bit in a little jar. We're talking about pots and pans. We're talking about vessels. We're talking about basins. And they were full, not just a little bit, full. Everybody say full. It says here, now it came to pass, verse 6, when the vessels were full, that she said to her son, bring me another vessel. And he said to her, there is not another vessel. Natural ran out. And then the verse says, and the oil ceased. How many know if there was enough vessels, she'd still be pouring oil today? If there was enough vessels, she'd never run out. The natural stopped first. And then the supernatural stopped. So what is it in relationship to give to God first and honor him, wh wh where does this come in? 
The seed that you sow, just like the farmer putting a kernel of corn into the ground, he's waiting on God to do his part. And he knows, as they say, you can count the number of seeds in a, you fill in the blank, but you can't count the number of you fill in the blanks in a seed. What's the natural? The natural will run out first. If I cast my bread out on the water all the time, all the time, all the time, just keep casting it out on the water time and time again, if I give and give and give and give, the natural will stop first. But God will just keep bringing the supernatural supply as long as there's something for him to bless. God doesn't add, he multiplies. I heard it said this way, the natural is the stage or the platform where which God demonstrates the supernatural. That's why we have ushers. Sit down, shut up, don't move, don't distract, knock it off. We're not trying to be mean. We're trying to get the natural in order. What if God? <laughs> Amen. People say, how come the elders sit in the front row? What if God? We get the natural in order so that way the supernatural can flow. It says, I want to read this to you again. I don't know if you've ever seen this before. Go and borrow vessels from everywhere. You know what that word everywhere means in Hebrew? Everywhere. <clears throat> Go and borrow vessels from everywhere, from all your neighbors. You know what that word all means in Hebrew? Everybody. Everybody. You see what I'm saying? Empty. Don't bring them in here full. Bring them empty. Don't gather just a few. And when you've come in, you shall shut the door behind you and your sons and pour that oil. She said she just had a little oil in the jar. Pour that oil into the vessels. And he said to her, pour the oil. Do something. When I give an offering, I cannot count you the 10,000 times I've said to the Lord, Lord, I'm pouring oil. I've got a vessel here. This money is a seed, and it is a vessel. I'm pouring oil. Don't let it ever run out. Don't let it ever run out. Don't let it. See, when I said at the very beginning, when I first started this sermon series, what I'm going to talk to you about will completely change your life in every area of your life, and that is not an overstatement, and I didn't oversell but you're going to have to change. That's cool to hear that. You've got to change. You've got to change how you think. You've got to change what you say. And if you will do it, no, I'm not promised you're going to be a millionaire. And no, just like I said in that sermon series that we finished up about limiting God, God didn't promise Jonathan an expected, planned out victory. And Jonathan did not promise his armor bearer triumph and victory. Jonathan promised his armor bearer an opportunity. Who knows God may be able to save by many or by few. I'm not promising that you're going to get your house paid off tomorrow. This is not the lottery. I love it when Christians start day one and they give an offering of like 15 cents and they're like, plus God, I'm going to have all my debts paid off now. <laughs> okay, well, that could happen. Cows could give Mountain Dew. So he says, go and get vessels, don't borrow a few. Shut the door, start to pour it into those vessels and set the full ones aside. Verse 5. So she went from him and shut the door behind her and her sons who brought the vessels to her, and she poured it out. Now it came to pass when the vessels were full. What a powerful, powerful statement. She said to her sons, bring another one. They said, there is no more. And the oil ceased. See, God is not a... a Amount, God. He's a percentage God. He doesn't care if you give 30% of your income, if you're a gazillionaire. 
because you haven't really given much of your increase. You've given more than a person who makes $5 an hour, but that person honoring God with four of their five has given more in the eyes and the economy of God than the person who's getting Jesus. You say, that's not true. Well, what did Jesus say? He said, this woman has given more. No, she didn't. Yes, she did. She said, this woman has given more from the little that she had than these who gave from their abundance. God's not about a dollar amount. He's about percentages. Are you getting anything out of this? Willing and obedient. Have I made you mad with that yet? I don't know about you, but I want to be a qualifier for that. Isaiah 119, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. I was going to get into... Hmm, I've, I've somewhere in the neighborhood of 32 or 3,300 sermons in my life, and that clock still goes fast. I've done this a couple of times. I'm tempted to preach 17 hours tonight. That's in me. I'm not going to do it, though. I was just saying I was tempted to. You know, Jesus, the Bible tells us that Jesus fed... In one chapter, the Bible tells us that Jesus fed 5,000 men with what? Does anybody remember? 5,000 males, right? You know that the very next, that's Matthew chapter 14. You know the very next chapter, Jesus fed 4,000 males with seven loaves and a few fish. You'd have thought that fish and loaves trick has been played out. Right? I mean, how many more times you can pull that rabbit out of the hat? See, what we have to understand is that Jesus never fell into the sin or the similitude or likeness of Adam, so he wasn't under the devil's authority. Never. He came to a world that was broken, and he came to a world that was fallen, but he himself was not broken, and he himself was not fallen. So he came in and said, you don't have any power over me, Buster. So I'm about to take what it is that you think you have from you and make this world cough up what it is that I need. Jesus produced that for those people with his authority and with faith. He said before the crowd, Father, I thank you that you always hear me. I thank you that everybody will know that you're my father. Bless this, do this. You know, and I've heard people say this before, that, that when the disciples, the Bible says, order, if you're willing and obedient. Jesus said, go sit them in groups. Ushers. Go place them in order. Get a structure. And so they did. Now, who knows? I don't know for sure, but what if they would have said, that's stupid. Why do I have to sit in the third row? I mean, why do I have to sit over here? Who knows if that would have limited the miracle? There's a reason it's recorded that he said, go and sit them down in groups. Nothing's in there just because. Amen. The ingredients for expedience is obedience. And I don't think that all of a sudden heaven just cracked open like it did on the day that Jesus was baptized in water and the heavens came out and angels sang and fish just started flying out of the mouth of heaven. I don't think that's what happened at all. Because that would have been spectacular and that would have been sensational, but God's miraculous. I think what happened is when they ripped a head off, a tail grew. And when they ripped the tail off, the head grew, the other half of the fish. And I've heard many a preacher tell that. And I think that's how God works. And the Bible says that they ate until they would not. I heard one preacher say one time, well, what happened was they saw this little boy was willing to offer up his lunch. They thought, oh, that's cute. Bless his darling heart and his empty head. And so they all pulled their sack lunch out and we all ate together. That ain't what happened at all. Why would Jesus pray for that? Why would they write in our text they ate all they would and then they collected and there were 12 baskets left over? In the next chapter, they ate all they would and there were seven baskets left over. Read it for yourself. I'm not making it up. I mean, Jesus knew what was up when it came to fish, right? Launch out in the deep. Uh, just do it. Okay, at your word. 
sink the boats. That's a good catch. Are you doing good? You all right? I'm going to give you a cliffhanger and just tick everybody off on Sunday. That's what we're going to do. We're going to we're not going to just help the faithful few tonight. We're going to make everybody mad on Sunday. We've got to start thinking the way the Bible talks about Jesus and stop saying what people say about him. I'll say that again because that's trending now on Facebook. We have to start saying what the Bible says about Jesus and stop saying what people say about him. A lot of people say he was a carpenter. Only one group of people in the whole entire place said that, and he left them. Never went back, moved his ministry out of Nazareth. A lot of people say he, he was poor. He, had, he was so poor he didn't have a place to live. That ain't what he said at all. And I got a problem with that, and we'll talk about that on Sunday. But did you know that Jesus was fully stocked and supplied? You know that your Bible tells you that not only was he fully stocked and supplied, he had more money than he knew what to do with for he and his followers. And so he sent Judas, who was the treasurer. If someone's broke, they don't need a treasure. If someone doesn't have anything, what's the sense in saying, well, you're an idiot, carry the purse? That's not what happened. There was something in the purse. There was a treasurer because there was treasure. Is it in your book? I'm not making it up. We'll talk about it on Sunday, I promise. You'll be happy or not, but we'll talk about it anyway. You know, in one place in the Bible, the Bible says that Jesus came to his home. I lied to you. It doesn't say that one time. It says that four times. Jesus came to his home. Jesus came to his hometown. Jesus came to his home city. Let's talk about Capernaum. Jesus went home. Well, if he doesn't have a place to call home, why would he go home? When you leave here tonight, you go to your address that you live in, you're going to say you're heading. That makes sense, right? It's the place you live. It's where your heart is. At least that's what they say. Jesus had a place to live. I'm not saying he owned it, but he, he wasn't out sleeping under the stars. Another thing we need to think about, we're done. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Keep your hate. I don't need it. Another bunch of people say that Jesus, Mary, and Joseph were so poor when they were going to deliver Jesus that they ended up going to sleep out and deliver that poor little baby in a manger. They just didn't have any money. Well, they went to the inns to get a room. It wasn't a money problem. It was a room problem. No vacancy. I imagine they said, crap. Like Jessica, she's about to burst. It's about time. It wasn't a money problem. It was a capacity problem. It was a room problem. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was ministered to by these magi. And we say, how many came from the east? How many came? How do you know? The Bible doesn't say that. It's Christian mythology. That's like angels in the manger. There weren't any angels in the manger. That's not what your Bible tells you at all. We're not going to get into that. Everybody's going to go and be mad at me and write nasty letters to me. And my nativity scene is the gospel. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Keep your angels, bro. The Bible doesn't say there was three magi from the east. Not one time does it say that. It says that they gave him gold and frankincense and myrrh, but yet we believe, well, there was just three. Well, you know, the Bible says that the entire city was in an uproar over three dudes. They've never had three people come through on a camel before? A little satchel of gold, a little frankincense, a little myrrh. We're not even sure what that is. But the whole city is in an uproar over three dudes on a camel, well, their own camel. Oprah Winfrey was not there. I don't know if you saw the story or not, but Oprah wasn't. That She thinks she was probably, but she wasn't. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Internet. But we believe things that we don't have any idea how many, but I can pretty much be willing to guarantee that the entire city of Owasso is not going to get hung up by three dudes coming through in a car. 
It's not going to be in an uproar. Even if someone, Andrea, even if someone wheeled through in a camel, people probably wouldn't stop and be in an uproar. They'd be like, what's that guy doing? Anyway, back to Kerwood. You know, it doesn't, because strange things happen those times of year. The whole city was in an uproar. You know, they left everything, and the Bible calls it a flight to Egypt. Doesn't that what it says in the text? That it was a flight to Egypt. They didn't gather up everything they had. They hit the road because they were under the impression that that guy really means he wants to kill all the baby boys. But somehow they lived in Egypt. You think they slept in a cardboard box underneath a bypass? See, we don't think about these things, and we say, well, that's extra biblical. Well, where did they sleep? Do you think Jesus raised the first two, three years of his life? He just slept in a manger? That would have been weird. It makes us think about things a little bit differently. We say Jesus was poor. Jesus had nothing. Jesus had many, Luke tells us, many. How many is many? It's at least more than three. How do I know that? Because they named three. Many women ministered to him of their substance over and over and over and over and over. How does a poor person who doesn't have anything have a treasure with treasury? And on the night that Jesus was going to reveal to everybody, on the night that Judas decided to go and betray him, one gospel writer says, we thought because he had the purse that he was out making ready for those who had need for the feast. And we thought that he was giving to the poor. Why would they automatically assume that if they had never watched Jesus say, hey, get some money out of the bag and give it to the poor. Hey, this person's trying to make ready for the feast. Take of the substance that we have and help them. The actual King James Version is against the feast. Take care of the bill against the feast. Why would they automatically assume that if Jesus was broke? We'll talk about some of that stuff. Did I make you upset? Well, then round two. Father, thank you for the word. Lord, we want to be both willing and obedient. Part of obedience, your word says that if we've sinned, we need to repent. That's not theatrical, and we don't have to come and cry and weep and throw ourselves on the altar and beg for forgiveness. We can just say, Lord, I've been thinking wrong about this, and my thinking has driven my actions. And so help me think different. Because if I think different, I'll act different. Let me think on these things. Let me think on your word. Let me think on whatsoever things are pure. That's what I want. That's what we want. And that's what we do tonight. We say, help us. Forgive us. Help us keep our mind focused and stayed on your word and what it says and not what we see. Thank you for the revelation that the natural will end being the supernatural will then end. She poured and said, give me more. And they said, there is no more. And then they, or, and then the oil, and then the oil ceased. Thank you that you are a miraculous God. Thank you that you honor your word and our faith in it. We thank you for talking to us about having authority, being yielded and submitted to you and your word, your purposes and your plan. In Jesus' name, amen.